Here's a few words with Jesse Bond of Southwest Fire Academy. Hey, man. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Good. Good, good. With the new year upon us, give me a rundown on what's coming up at SFA. Yeah, so I'll I'll just keep it short and more to our pre-service program. I know everyone's going to be excited for this episode with Romagus. Anyone who's looking for or knows someone who's looking to get into the fire service, definitely check out our website, southwestfireacademy.ca. We have about 10 boot camps on the calendar for 2024, and they're booking up, but there's still quite a few spots. It's a very flexible and accommodating program for anyone's schedule. And it's a tough program, but that's what you should want getting into this profession. And we have some of the best instructors, not only in Ontario, but in North America. And so we try to really produce the best firefighters possible. So yeah, I'll keep it with that and just wish everyone a happy new year. Welcome to episode 77 of Multiple Calls. I'm Scott Hewlett. It's true that those that can't do teach, and those people should be leaving it up to teachers that can. Firefighting isn't for everyone. Teaching firefighting is for even fewer. There is nothing like leaving a class different than when you arrived. You didn't know before. You may not have wanted to know. You may have even fought hard not to know. But the right person with the right knowledge the right experience, and the right approach is undeniable. It is obvious that their motivation is to open minds, and respectful entry is their craft. You can choose not to do anything with what you are present for, but as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the mind once stretched by a new idea never returns to its original dimensions. Say what you want, but you can't say you didn't know. It's a pleasure to bring you Kyle Romagus. All right, man, we'll kick off with where you grew up. I grew up in Austin. I moved to Austin, Texas when I was four. I was born in where I live now in East Montgomery County. Me and my dad pretty much lived together my whole life. My mom and dad split when I was young. I stayed with my dad. We had foster kids growing up, so uh, we always had a house full between four and I think we had eight at one time growing up. It was a little strange growing up that way, but it made me value what I had because they came from rough lives, man. Did you have brothers and sisters as well on top of the foster family? Yeah, I did. I have a half brother. We share a mom, different dads. Uh, He's four years older than me. He lived with my mom. I lived with my dad pretty much my whole life. We kept the foster kids after my mom and dad split. So I was just in and out throughout my childhood. It was kind of strange dynamic between me and my dad because he never wanted to make them feel like they weren't important you know what i mean because they came from rough lives anyway and then they came into our life and we wanted them to feel important but he did also didn't want me to feel like i wasn't important you know what i'm saying like i was the only biological kid in the house so like my dad would pick me up from school for doctor's appointments and we we'd go shoot pinball and play pool and that was our time together because he never wanted to make the other kids feel like they were second are you still in touch with anybody from those years? Yeah, we talked to a few of them. A few of them uh, we talked to, the rest of them just kind of scattered. Because when they got adopted, they would come to us. We were a housing unit. And then when they got adopted, they would be adopted into a family. I think there was one that didn't get adopted that she turned 18 when she lived with us and then ended up getting emancipated. All the rest of them, they ended up either going back with their original parents or a family member of the biological family or ended up getting adopted. Like I was saying, it really gave me value in home life and family, seeing it from the other side. I didn't grow up in an abusive home, and my dad was always real good to us, and I couldn't even imagine growing up like that. But seeing it from that side, it really kind of shows you what the world's like at a young age. What was your school experience like then? Were you in the same grade ever with any of the kids? A few of them. We had some that were younger, some that were older, and then some that were in my grade So we grew up together, you know, looked out for each other. I can't say that their school experience was normal because kids suck, man. (laughs) You know, so no, knowing that they grew up the way they did and they were in foster homes, it always came with challenges with relationships and kids. They, uh, 
they are destined to tell the truth <laughs> from birth. You know what I mean? Like there's no filter. <laughs> it was rough on them, but we looked out for each other. My school life was like really good, man. I had, I had fun in school. As a teenager, I was uh, a little rambunctious, broke the rules. I wasn't uh, straight laced as I should have been throughout school. Ended up paying for it in the long run, but I never really got into anything fire related until after. I didn't even really understand what the fire department did until after I graduated high school. I never had any encounters with them. Well, I guess one time I did, my dad threw his back out. We lived on like the third floor of an apartment complex and he threw his back out. He like lifted a drill case and threw his back out. That was the first experience I had with a backboard. My dad was a big dude. We were in an apartment complex, so it was real tight stairwells and circular stairwells going up. Watching them challenge with that, it was interesting the way they they handled it. But that was really my first exposure to the fire department other than them coming to school and doing uh, fire safety week and all that stuff. And what jobs did you have before the fire service? Or did you have odd jobs as a kid? And So I worked retail when I was a kid, worked at GNC, worked at a haircut place, sweeping up hair for $5 an hour, worked at Old Navy. After I graduated high school, I got a job at a chemical plant and I was just a hand at the chemical plant. I did whatever they told me to do, fix anything, paint anything, clean up. I walked the pipeline. We did it a quarter of the year. Every quarter, we would have to walk the pipeline in certain areas and with the sniffers and gas detectors. So, so that was really eye-opening because I had never seen that side of the infrastructure on the gas side. It was a uh, natural gas plant that essentially they pushed gas through the pipeline. So I got exposed to that, not knowing that I was going to be a fireman. <laughs> that I got exposed to that early. It came in handy on the industrial side in the fire department after that, my knowledge base from that. But I worked there while I was going through fire school. In Texas, you have to be a medic and a fireman. You can't get a job unless you are a medic. So I went through fire school first like an idiot. Nobody gave me any advice or anything. you know. So I went through fire school first and couldn't get a job. So then I had to go through medic school before the state of Texas would certify me. What brought fire up as an option for you? Funny story. So when I was going back to me being not real straight-laced as a teenager, got in trouble with the law. That's why I ended up moving back to East Montgomery County from Austin, got in trouble with the law, ended up moving back with my mom in East Montgomery County. I was 18, 17, 18, fresh out of high school, I ended up having to do community service. Man, it was hundreds of hours, dude. I ended up doing it at the fire station here locally. And that was my first inside view into the firehouse. I think I was like 18. My cousin that I had known my whole life. I had no idea he was a fireman. He was a fireman at the fire department. So we like reconnected after all these years because when we were young, we were inseparable. And then as we grew older, we kind of grew apart because I lived in Austin. He lived in East Brooklyn County. It's about four hours difference, three and a half, four hours difference, 180 miles. We kind of grew apart. And then I show up at the firehouse to do community service and he's on duty at the firehouse. So we reconnected. I started kind of asking him about the fire service and he was explaining to me what the ins and outs were. I was like, they pay you for this? <laughs> <laughs> like, I was able to ride the rig a couple times after the community service was done and then ended up joining the fire department. It was a combination department. So I joined the volunteer side, started realizing what was all going into the fire service, what they did and kind of calls they ran. And I was like, man, they pay you for this? Like, I can, I can get a job doing this? Made some fires as a volunteer, still worked at the gas plant. I went through fire school, went through EMT school, and then ended up getting a job. So I got a job for $28,000 a year. That was my first fire job. And what was the process they make you go through to get on at that point? That was not very difficult for me, just the fire department I was in. So I was able to jump straight on what they call a duty crew, which is part-time staffing. So as soon as I got certified, I was able to jump on a duty crew. And East Montgomery County is two fire departments that merge together. So it used to be two different fire departments. I was a first a volunteer at the department. It was called Splendor Fire Department. And I was a volunteer there. And then they merged in 2011, I think. But this was back in 2004, 2003, when I joined the fire department back then. I ended up getting on the duty crew. I didn't have to go through a rigorous testing process until I went full-time. And then I tested a few places Ended up getting a, a full-time job at a department here locally within the county. And I was working on the duty crew or part-time 
at New Caney at the time because East Montgomery County is Splendora and New Caney after they merged. So they merged together and formed East Montgomery County Fire Department. And so I worked at another fire department in the county. I got offered a lieutenant's job way early, way unprepared, didn't deserve it, didn't earn it, and had no idea what being a supervising officer was. And I was a probationary firefighter at my first full-time job in the county when I was offered a full-time job at New Caney when they went full-time from being duty crew only. So I was one of the first nine that got hired on at New Caney, which became East Montgomery County full-time. So I was hired on there as a lieutenant with about two and a half years of fire service experience, not prepared at all. <laughs> like every single one of the company officers that works for East Montgomery County that were the early ones, none of us were prepared. It's a problem I see in the fire service over and over again. I thought it was just us. I was like, man, everybody else must have it figured out. They're developing their company officers. They got mentor programs and you start seeking out and you're like, no, that's not how things go in the, in the American fire service, unfortunately. So I'm trying to fix that from the inside now that I have influence, but the fire service in America is notorious for not developing their leaders, man. And then we see things go awry at the fire department and we wonder why, but we don't develop our people, man. Did you get caught by any jobs in those early days when you were inexperienced in that role? Any eye-opening experiences? There were several fires that I didn't understand at all why it didn't go the way it would. Because, like, we're pretty busy out here. we got low income, high population, so which is the equation for fires. So we make about 80 to 100. And back then when we were separate, we made, like, maybe 40 and 40 a year. But that's not counting mutual aid. That's just our district. So I would make, like, maybe 15, 20 a year, about... 80% of them would go well. They were very small, room and contents, couple of rooms off, but the real challenging fires would always not go well at all. <laughs> and uh, it took me a while to figure out and understand, like, if it wasn't basic, if it wasn't 10 feet in, taking a left, and we had to find it or we had to wait till it found us, that's where the challenging fires got us. We emulated Houston for a long time. Because you emulate what you see as successful with large departments. Every fire department does. The large department that surrounds them. So Houston surrounds us. We tried to emulate the city of Houston for a long time. And we figured out through watching sunrises over smoke plumes that we couldn't do what they do. Their staffing level was way tremendously larger than ours. Their abilities, their resources. We just didn't have the ability to do what they do. And it took us figuring that out the hard way to find our groove with low manpower. So, I mean, we're task saturated and manpower limited. So we had to do what we had to do with what we got. Lots of fires didn't go well early on. And then it took me figuring out little things at each one, what didn't go well, what did go well. And the good thing about being busy like that is you get repetition. So you get the ability to see what does work, what doesn't work. Attic fires were challenging early on until I had some mentorship under some guys that, kind of coached me in that in that aspect because they're tricky man attic fires can be tricky if you don't know what you're looking for so you think you got it and you don't it ends up wrapping around you or flanking you from the other side and it took burning down a lot of stuff unfortunately to uh figure out some mindsets and some game plans up front and in the age before the internet too yeah for sure i mean it was out there i wasn't really exposed to it fire engineering had blogs fire nuggets was out there i just didn't know anything about them at that time, it was late in my career when I started networking outside of my area. And that's notorious for most people. They get caught in their bubble. They get in their territorial bubble and what you know is what you know and who you know is who you know. It's not until you start reaching out, finding mentors from other agencies that you really get your eyes opened. Is that when the fire dynamics, fire behavior sort of education for you really started or were there guys within your department that were starting it for you or was it more just the practical experience at that point? I had some guys around me that were way smarter than me. A few guys that were book smart, a lot of street smart guys, but I was young and dumb and didn't take advantage of them when they were close. And it took me growing up, so to speak, in the fire service, hitting that plateau before I realized what I had around me and then reconnected with those guys. Back then, you know, you see guys that were well experienced. They had a lot of fires under their belt and you're young and dumb. It's like, what do they know? Those are the old guys. I try to tell younger guys now, it's like, take advantage of that experience, man. You may not agree with them, 
but draw gold out of them. You know what I mean? Like they may not even know it's gold, but you got to draw those stories out of them. Just little things. We got a guy in Houston that works part-time with us. We used to work together a lot and I'd just ask him for stories on fires. It's like, tell me about a fireman. Tell me about a fire that you haven't talked to me about. He was telling me about one that was across the street from his firehouse. Like he opened the bay door and a smoke was coming in the firehouse. Like he knew he had one. People everywhere, like floods of people everywhere because it was a large apartment building. He ended up getting trapped in a bathroom for some reason. He was on the third floor, trapped in the bathroom, running out of air, and he couldn't find the door. Like he kept sweeping and sweeping and he couldn't find the door. He kept finding the closet door. He kept finding the bathroom sink and he finally found the toilet which he thought was funny. I thought it was funny at the time. So he sat on the toilet and started reaching out. He's like, man, every time I've ever been in the bathroom, usually the toilet's within at the same or similar level than the doorknob. So he sits down on the toilet and he starts reaching out and then boom, finds the doorknob. And he tells us that story without the knowledge base of the gold that's inside of it. Like say that again, let's go through that again. But those types of dudes, you got to draw the gold out of them because they lived it. And they just may not see the inside story. There's lessons and you got to kind of pick and choose from the war stories and the lessons, but they're in there, man. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by a bunch of dudes with experience, which I was able to start asking questions and poking at them and getting different lessons learned out of them. A buddy of mine told me one time experiences equates to you doing the wrong thing more than the other guy and getting away with it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. wise men learn from the experience of others and fools learn from experience. That's even like driving. Like you, you drive for so long, you just think, oh, I just drive. And then you start talking to someone about driving and you realize, oh my God, there's, there's a lot that when you break it down and talk to someone about it, there's a lot that's going on in your head just automatically. Yeah. Especially the pump operator. That position as a whole was really underrated where we're from and it took us making mistakes because we're surrounded by areas with no water. Like 80% of my district is non-hydrated. So the mentors that we were able to get from like the city of Houston, the large fire departments are surrounded by hydrants. It's like, well, I can't take advice from him. He's going to skull drag us to his hydrant in 150 feet. Like in that aspect of it, of water supply, I can't take advice from that dude. You know what I mean? So you got to reach out to dudes like Dennis and Paul Shapiro, rest in peace. And Guys that really understood moving big water, you know, Michael Guzzi and Andy Sacadato. And there's resources out there. Just because they come from a large urban fire department doesn't mean they can solve all your problems. I found that out through experience. Were you guys doing the booster backup at that point because of you didn't have hydrants or were you always using tankers? We called it the daisy chain back in the day. We would daisy chain apparatus together and it's really not a, a, when you do more than one, it's really not an efficient water supply, but we found ourselves doing it over and over again. It's hope. That strategy is hope. I hope I'm going to get it with the first one. If I don't, I got the second one there and I hope I get it with the second one. If I don't, I got the third one. It took us really breaking down our water supply operations to get good at it. And we ran out of water a lot, man. And it took us trial and error to figure out orders of operations for water supply. Booster backup came into our department from Kurt. So like my fire chief, Howard, he mentored under Kurt for like three or four years before I met him. He would bring these things to the fire department in the operations division. I actually met Kurt in 2018, like five years ago, and I heard him speak and our operational guidelines were already written and reevaluated and Howard was fire chief at the time. Kurt's up there talking, he's talking about booster backup and talking about our attack model and so I called Howard afterwards. I was like, hey, man, I just saw this dude speaking. He's talking about what we do, like everything that he said we do. I was like, do you know this guy? And he was like, no, no, man, we do what he does. <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't do what we do. <laughs> that was the first time I met Kurt was at Firemanship Conference in Portland in 2018. He brought Booster back up into, into our department, Howard mentoring under him. When did you get into instructing? When did that start for you? I started early in instructing and not really instructing like I do now, but just, I've always had the ability to deliver messages. I've always been able to package information in a way to where it was well received by people. My wife always jokes. She's like, people just pay you to explain shit to them. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I guess you, I guess you're right. But I got into it early when I joined the fire department, I got a grasp on the information pretty quick. Like I'm a super nerd, dude. I always have been. I'm a nerd for science. I'm a nerd for physics. I was throughout high school. 
I understood physics and chemistry and science before I got into the fire service. So like when I started looking at fire behavior and I started looking at building construction, the pieces fit together. I had a baseline knowledge base of physics and chemistry. And when I started expanding that and isolating it towards the fire service, it just made sense. So like fire behavior and building construction are topics that are really important to me, especially for new guys. And it's not sexy. So a lot of guys don't spend a whole lot of time on it. And you really got to break it down to an elementary level for them and make them understand the importance of them. So like early in my career, even before I was a full-time fireman, I was put into positions to train the new guy. Even when I was the new guy, I was put in positions to train the new guy because the dudes with the experience at that time didn't really have the ability to package that information. They had it. It was there. They had it in their heart and their head. They had the Rolodex, but they just couldn't deliver it in a way to where it was well-received or they couldn't form the words they were trying to say. The older guys, they were always like, the mindset was learn from experience and you learn by doing and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. We're just going to go do it and build your mindset and your experience level around what you do. You're going to be shortchanging yourself. If you wait for you to make the mistake, it's, it may never happen in your career. You know what I mean? Like you may never get a chance to build that Rolodex if you don't expand your mind a little bit or a lot actually. Early on, probably around 2005, I started explaining shit to people, as my wife would call it, in the fire service. I became a lead instructor at a fire academy in 2012, and I did that for five years, and it, it turned me off of instructing, to be honest with you. I, if you've never taught in the academy setting, it's, it's tough, man, because you're, you're time limited, you're handcuffed with information and curriculum. You can defer from it. So like in Texas, there's three levels of instructor for the certification instructor one, you can teach curriculum that that's given to you. Instructor two, you can mold the curriculum that's given to you for the audience that you're delivering it. And then three, you create curriculum. I was an instructor two at the time. So I had an opportunity to mold it for the audience, but the curriculum, I was just disappointed with it, man. It didn't match the street. It didn't match what I felt at the time in certain topics should be delivered but you got that handcuff on you because you have to teach them to the test. And that was always disappointing to me. And I hate saying it now. Like it pains for me for those words to come out of my mouth. Like I'm going to teach you how to take the test. And then maybe if we have time and I'm able to, I can teach you how we do it in the street. It's tough. And so that was really disheartening for me. I'm glad I did it. And I wouldn't not do it if I could do it all over again. I'm glad I had that experience. A lot of guys go to the fire academy early in their career, and it's a blur. Quick process. They want to get out of it. The minute they get in it, they're ready to go to work, and they don't really take in the cogs in the wheel of why things occur there, and half of them don't even remember what they learned there anyway. Being able to spend five years inside of it, it really started to to open my eyes of where the gaps in Grand Canyons exist between what they have to learn and what they're expected to know when they show up seven o'clock in the morning on shift and what they actually know, what they should know to, to make it in the street. Cause we're low manpower. We ride a three man engine and my fire department was all engines since 1962. So I guess when new Caney fire department was established it was 62. So it's not a really old fire department. We don't have the 1800s experience that large urban fire departments have with traditions and experience and, and huge Rolodexes that they have. We did engine work and sprinkled a little truck work on top of it with low manpower. And when you have a three-man engine like that, you have to be independent operators. You're going through the threshold with two people and one of them's humping hose. So like that dude on the nozzle, which is usually the youngest dude on your crew, because the only people who are going through the threshold is the company officer and the nozzleman. And that dude's fresh out of the academy. And you have a level of expectation of what his knowledge base is until you get into that environment. And you really realize what these dudes actually know when they get out of the fire academy. And you have to bring that level of expectation down. And I would recommend that everybody spend some time in the academy, at least at the bare minimum as a live fire instructor, to be able to see the cogs in that wheel. And because they experienced it for a short amount of time in their career, 
when they went to the fire academy and then they gained experience and then the more you pack into that rolodex the more separated you are from where you were early in your career so like i said you got that level of expectation it's like you don't know that like you don't know breaking that window is a bad idea you don't know that cutting the hole in the wrong spot is going to draw the fire through the attic you think they have that experience but they don't so i spent five years in the fire academy got back on the rig after the fire like i was ready to leave the fire service at that point like if i didn't get a job in the fire service that like i was going to go be a carpenter or a plumber i was going to do something else i couldn't do the job of leading and instructing in a uh, fire academy anymore like i was at that breaking point to where it was ruining my love for the fire service at that time and it just so happened that my fire department that I'm at now, again, East County, I was at New Caney. We merged while I was in the academy or right before. And then uh, there was a captain that took a job on a, at a chemical plant. Like the day I was walking in to be like, all right, I'm done with this. It was like the clouds opened up and sunshine down and he was leaving as a captain and there was a captain position open. And I was like, man, and I talked to Howard and I was like, dude, I, I got to come back to the rig. He was like, well, it just so happens. And I was like, I know. <laughs> so it worked out perfect. So I was able to jump back on the rig. Two years after that, we started teaching on the circuit. Well, we started teaching locally for local fire departments. And then we moved into, we just got so lucky, man, that we got picked up by, by mentors. They like what we had to say. They like what we did. They like what we were capable of. And they kind of took us under our, their wing and, Rest is history, man. Now I travel with them and I'm able to go around the country, international, went saw you guys in Canada, going to Germany next year. It's been fun, man. And it's fun to uh, connect with people you you only read. I only read your books. I never met you before. And now we're able to to break bread and travel the country together. It's, It's cool, man. Did you get connected with Oath Keepers, CF Tactics, and FD Tactics? Did that come before Cruel Intentions? The first cadre I started teaching with was me and my buddy Howard with FD Tactics. He formed FD Tactics late 2017. So my buddy Dave Mellon, I don't know if you know Dave, he owns Valor Fire Training. We were watching this fire department get tore to pieces on social media. They made a fire. It's very short-staffed, low-budget fire department. They got like three air packs between the whole fire department. And they made this fire and posted it on social media and like neighbors were humping hose and changing air bottles and almost all the water was coming from the outside. Like they, they could not operate and they were just getting ripped apart on social media. I started commenting on it and Dave started commenting on it. So Dave rings my phone. He's like, Hey man, why don't we go help these guys? Everybody's tearing them apart. Why don't we just put something together and call these dudes and say, Hey, we'll come out for free. If you got time, we have time. And we'll come out and make you more efficient with what you're capable of. Because we didn't know anything about the fire department, what they had, the resources they had, the manpower. It was Dave that reached out. And we had already taught at a few fire departments already under FT Tactics at that time. When Dave called, it was it just lined up. He taught search. We taught the engine company for that fire department. And we taught for two days. That's really when it kicked off. When you're able to see light bulbs come on. Because like we only teach what we do. I ain't teaching nobody else's shit. We don't teach anything we don't do in in East County. We just expressed what was working for us over 10 years of experience, what we found worked well on the fire ground. That's what we teach. We teach the hose loads we run. We teach the way we pull them. We teach the way we use the nozzle. All of that is what we do at East County. It just kind of took off from there, man. Oath Keepers, I was a super nerd for the fire service for a long time. Still am. Anytime I'm able to get in the front row, man, I'm taking notes and I'll listen to anybody speak once. And if I like them, I'll listen to them many, as many times as I can. So I took Oath Keepers, the conference as a student. We had some acquires or they had some acquires. I wasn't on the cadre yet. Uh, I was in Northern Ohio. And one of the stations was a flat load and we teach the flat load and we use the flat load at East County. We pull it five different ways. They were teaching the flat load at the station and they were only pulling it one way. And it was the standard flat load, dump it on the ground, run with the nozzle, grab the coupling. So like Oath Keepers, the way it's designed is it now it's one day lecture. Back then it wasn't. It's one day all engine and one day all truck. And then you switch the the next day. So uh, first day was engine for me and they were teaching the flat load. They only taught it one way. And so I went through the whole day. And then at the bar at the social, I pulled 
my buddy now i didn't know him then sean hughes aside he was teaching that the flat load station i was like hey man i can really blow your mind with that flat load you know like it's it's way more versatile than what you were able to show today and at that point i had never taught at a conference i had only taken classes at conferences and i didn't really know the inside of what it takes to actually put together a class at a conference like you're way time limited you're student to instructor ratio is usually way too high my expectation level of what that station could have been was almost unreasonable <laughs> for the conference level you got eight stations in an eight hour day that's hour a station and depending on how many people you got anyway i was talking to him at the bar i was like dude i can really blow your mind with that flat load that turned into pulling the flat load at the bar <laughs> and then chris gilpin which is the president of Oath Keepers, he came up to me the next day and he was like, hey, man, you want to teach that station tomorrow? And I was like, really? He was like, yeah, why don't you teach that station and show them what you do with that flat load? And I was like, all right. So I was supposed to take the truck class the next day. My buddy was on the truck cadre, my buddy Matt Doney. I told him that morning because he was like, you ready to get your shit pushed in, bro? Because he was teaching the, the truck side. I was like, actually, I'm teaching the flat load on the engine side. And he was like, you big pussy going to the engine side. You're not even going to go through the truck day. So I taught the flat load and then Oath Keepers, they vote. It's a cadre of other pieces of cadres. You know what I'm saying? Like the way I look at it and a lot, they don't like to think of themselves as this, but the way I look at it, it's like an all-star team. You see the all-star teams in the professional sports. They take the all-star players from all the teams and they form a team with it. That's what I see as Oath Keepers is that they all come from different cadres and there's about 50 of them that come together on the convergence of Ohio every year. They vote. The engine cadre has a cadre and the truck cadre has their own cadre and they vote members in to the cadre. You don't just show up and you're like, hey, man, I'm teaching here. You know, like they vote you in. They voted on the while well, I was on the plane on the way home. Gilpin called and asked me if I wanted to join the gang, man. I was like, absolutely. Absolutely. And the rest is history from there. So now I've taught at Oath Keepers every year since then, but I don't teach the flat load anymore. They got me in the stairwell most of the time. Yeah, it's fun, man. Those dudes are, uh, they're second to none, man. That, that crew that teaches with that conference and we do it for free, which I didn't know at the time that none of those dudes got paid to do it, but all the instructors for Oath Keepers, we, we don't, we don't take a check. It's all donated to charity. The conference covers our hotel and flight, and we don't take a check from there, and everything is donated after that. So about two years in, I figured out where the money was going. It just solidified my participation with it after that. Um, the Jamie Dickman Foundation was started by, I believe, Northern Ohio Fools. I may be wrong about that one, though. But Jamie Dickman died in a fire in Toledo, Ohio in 2014. They started a foundation to in his name, and it's the Jamie Dickman Foundation, and it supports guys in Ohio going to fire school. So half the money usually goes to that or the Northern Ohio Fools, and then the other half just goes to another charity. Yeah, Oath Keepers is uh, my favorite conference of the year. CF Tactics, I was a groupie <laughs> for Kurt. So I, like, I followed Kurt around. When I found out that Howard was mentoring under Kurt, and that's where everything almost that we did operationally came from pretty much kurt runs the fire department very similar to ours except for it's five times as large in the district so we have 144 square miles he has over 600 square miles so it's about five times as big but his versatility of his district is very similar to ours trailer fires commercial fires large residential fires like the dynamic is out there and so his mindset and tactical abilities on the fire ground matched what we needed. We couldn't mimic Houston anymore because we just couldn't do what they did. And then Howard was able to start mentoring under Kurt and it just, they flow together. You know what I mean? Like what we do and what they do is very similar because our districts are very similar. Our manpower is very similar. So like I was a groupie for Kurt and I followed him around the country and I probably saw him lecture 15 times before he asked me to do something at on the beach and uh, i just kept coming back and coming back and coming back sitting in the front row 
soaking up every instructor, taking as many hot classes as I could down there. At the same time that I was instructing other places, just being able to be there around because he gets a bad rap from a lot of people because he brings his buddies to the beach. So guys that go repeatedly to Pensacola, they're like, man, you always bring your buddies to the beach. And he's like, well, yeah, you find me somebody that's better on truck operations than Mike Champo and I'll put him in his spot. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like just being around those dudes and being able to soak up that knowledge base was awesome. It was really cool to be invited to that table for Kurt to reach out and say, hey, man, I want you to do this here. Knowing that I taught other places, he wanted me to do it on the beach. I was honored to be a part of that and still am to this day. So that's how I got in with CF Tactics. And when did you put Cruel Intentions together? Cruel Intentions came together two years ago, two and a half years ago. First time I did it was at Corley's conference in Oklahoma. But that information has been distributed to probies that worked under me for at least six, seven years prior to that. I used to draw it on the whiteboard. So like that's where it kind of started was the whiteboard pick. I had a probie that was working with me from another shift. And I and I always, when it comes down to nozzle work, I just flood this whiteboard with goals and expectations and things to look for and nuggets that I've either learned through experience and mostly learned from other people, either through books or through Rolodexes I was able to flip through or side conversations I was able to have with dudes that were pre-SCBA, which is another one I would recommend that if anybody gets an opportunity to talk to somebody that was pre-SCBA, I would take advantage of that. What we're doing now, what they fa- what they found through studies is that, surprise, surprise, it's better for the unprotected civilian to work like they did pre-SCBA, which shouldn't be a surprise because the dudes that were pre-SCBA were the victim. They were the fire victim. They were the only difference between the victim and, and the fireman back then was the nozzle. So, I mean, if you're able to, to take pre-SCBA tactics you'd be real surprised to see that it's very similar to what UL and NIST and all the studies are saying is best for the unprotected civilian. So anyway, I used to just flood the whiteboard, dude, with just have it pour out of my head, straight through my hand on the whiteboard. Corley saw a picture of it on social media and he reached out. And that was the first time, well, that was the second time I was a guest on his podcast. And we did the whiteboard episode, which is number 75 on the weekly scrap. It was like we got done with that, and I went through the whole whiteboard and the mindset behind nozzle work, and Corley was like, do you teach this to anybody? And I was like, well, yeah, the probies that come through. And he was like, you need to put something together. You should put something together. I got a conference coming up. You should do something. And I was like, all right. I didn't ever lecture. We were teaching hot for on the circuit for probably two years, maybe two and a half before then, and I had never taught a lecture. I had no ambition to stand in front of hundreds of people and, and lecture them. I want to go put in work with them. That was my mindset was like, I'm good at engine work. I want to go put in work on the drill ground. And I never really had a mindset to teach any lectures or anything, but it was actually Corley pushing me. And the, the cruel intentions was the second lecture I came up with, but it was him pushing me to put it together for his conference and the whiteboard episode and the success of that. And I was like, man, people want to hear about it. I'll put it together. It kind of morphed over time. It hasn't morphed much, but it's still the the same whiteboard, man. Like if you were to go look at the whiteboard pick, like it is cruel intentions. But I added in a little bit more on hose, the mindset that was filled in along with the actual nozzle work. It's easy for instructors to toot their own horn, but I think cruel intentions is a must for anyone that's new in the fire service. Like going back to what we were talking about, about filling the gap. I think cruel intentions or at least the whiteboard, the discussion is a must for any probie. And I'm not trying to toot my own horn here and I give it away. Anybody who asked me for the presentation, I give them the presentation. My mindset is once you share it with people, it's not yours anymore. I don't own that information. The fire service does. I don't mind giving it out. I just ask them to present it with context. I was loaned a lot of videos for that program from good friends that I don't give out but I give them their contact information who gave them to me. If they want to give them those videos that I use, then that's their business. But I don't make a habit out of burning friendships that way. You know what I mean? Like they gave me this, this information, but it's a must, man. It fills a lot of gaps in for a lot of new nozzlemen that don't really understand how to navigate in low visibility, high heat conditions. They don't have that Rolodex. You said that was the second time you were on the scrap 
how did you and Corley get connected in the beginning? Man, honestly, I think Corley just reached out to me. I had done a few podcasts before. I didn't even know Corley was doing the weekly scrap at that time when he reached out. He sent me a Facebook message, I think. It was before I got banned from Facebook. But he sent me a Facebook message, or maybe it was after, I don't know. Anyway, and asked me if I wanted to be a guest on the scrap. He was already in the the Facebook group ECR and kind of knew who I was. But early on, I didn't know who he was and never had watched his show before. He reached out and wanted to do a podcast. He may have listened to a podcast that I had done already. I don't know. I'd have to talk to him about that and see why he even reached out to some goofy guy with a mustache from Texas. I'm glad he did. The second round that I did with him is the whiteboard. Yeah, he just cold called me one day, man. Said, hey, you want to talk about some fire shit? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And when did you start working behind the scenes with him? It was probably about a year ago. Man, it's hard to tell time now that COVID came into our lives, man. COVID really screwed up because like the world stopped for a year. So like it could have been two years ago. It was probably about a year and a half ago. So I had been a guest on his show twice at that time, I think. After I had been a guest on a show, I start. I was a fan of the show at, the, at that point. I found it at that moment and then started going back to old episodes and then watching the new ones when they were live. And I caught him at a conference. I think we were on Pensacola Beach. I caught him at the conference and I was like, hey, man, because I was a guest on his show. And this is no offense meant to Corley at all. Preface that with this, that I think he's excellent at what he does. And his show is different than any other podcast that I, that fire podcast that, that I've seen because it incorporates the audience so much into the discussion. But I told him, I was like, coming from a guy who's been a guest on your show twice and coming from a fire service nerd, I think that some of these dudes that have come on your podcasts, I think there would have been more gold had you been able to be more in tune with who you were talking to and drew it out of them. You know what I mean? Like some dudes, they can carry their own conversation. Like I could sit here and talk for hours on any topic that you want to talk about. Cause I just can talk like that. But some dudes, you got to draw it out of them. Like you got to squeeze them like an orange. They got it up here, but you got to pull it. And when he incorporates the chat room back then, before he had somebody to watch the chat room, it was like almost like talking to somebody who wasn't paying attention to you because he wasn't. He was watching the he was watching the chat. He was hearing what you were saying, but you're multitasking, which you can't multitask. <laughs> yeah, there was no conversation going on. There wasn't a full engagement between somebody. So I pulled him aside. I was like, "Hey, man, you know what? What I think would help you out to draw that gold out of some of those dudes because I've heard some of those dudes and talked to those dudes that he's had on his podcast." And there was gold there that I got just talking to him. The gold necessarily wasn't there on the podcast. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's no offense meant to those dudes or Corley, but I was like, man, you got to be in tune with the guests, man. You got to have a conversation with some of these dudes. I was like, so how about this? How about you find a guy that will watch the chat room for you and then pull questions out of it? Because the chat room's like comments and emojis and quotes and links, but there's buried in there questions from the audience. So I told him, I was like, you need somebody to watch that chat room and pull the questions out onto another document. So you don't have to search for them. And then they're right there in front of you. So like when you get to a point to where there's a stall in the conversation, or you feel like you want to engage with the audience, you can just look to the right and then boom, they're there and you don't have to search for them. And he's like, man, that's a great idea. You want to do it? <laughs> I was <just> like, <laughs> well, shit, it was kind of my idea. So yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. And then we we hooked up from there and a little behind the music there. We've got a Google Drive document in between. So like now he's on YouTube and Facebook. So now on the scrap when I'm there, when I'm able to do it, because he's got another guy named Sam that helps him with it when I can't be there because I can't make all of them. And then sometimes he schedules them and doesn't call me and my phone will go off and he says scraps live. And I'm like, well, shit, you know, he's already <laughs> going. So I'm not going to jump in it. So like I have the Facebook chat room up and the YouTube chat room up on my screen. And then I'm in the middle, I've got the doc that I share with him. And then I'm just scouring both chat rooms, just pulling questions out and changing the priorities of them. Like if, if they're on a topic that there's a good question about, I'll bring it to the top, make it real big, color it red, get his intention 
he calls me the producer. I wouldn't necessarily call me the producer, but, and I add my own questions in there too. So like, if I know he's talking to a dude that I know personally, and there's some gold that I think everybody would benefit and he's not getting there, like he's just not touching it. I'll just throw a question in, move it up to the top, make it real big and be like, Hey man, ask him this. T ended up for him. just like, boom, and I'll knock it out of the park. No. And I like that every once in a while, there's a question directly from you for the guest. Yeah, because sometimes I know backstories with a lot of these dudes. I spend a lot of time with a lot of guys on the circuit. I'm very fortunate in that. When you start teaching on the circuit, you start traveling around, you start running into these dudes, and then you start getting on the same schedule almost at the conferences with them. So you're able to hear the backstories, and you hear the lecture five times in a row. And like some guys, they're cookie cutter. Like it's rehearsed, and it's the same every time you hear it. And then some dudes, it depends. Like, Kurt is the most dynamic lecturer that I've ever heard. I've heard him give the same lecture probably 15 to 20 times, and every single one of them is different. There's no cookie cutter. There's no plan. It's just a shotgun blast against the wall. (laughs) Yeah. And sometimes those dudes need to be prompted or reminded about certain aspects. I think the audience benefits from the back room knowledge of that. So I could just tee it up and then just watch him slam it. So it's cool. When did you decide to promote up again from captain? Let's take a step back and then walk me up the chain. So I got hired on as a Lieutenant early on, like I was saying, without any experience, I had no business being there, made a lot of mistakes as a Lieutenant had no business leading company, but we did it. Everybody at East County kind of, that was like what we did. It's your turn. That was the the mindset behind it. Unfortunately, there was no promotional process that, that was really good. I got promoted to captain because it was my turn. <laughs> that was in like 2010. At that time, they had opened another station and they had put lieutenants over there. I saw it as a problem having two guys of the same rank without a supervising officer. I made it known to the chief that it was probably a bad idea, not hunting for the captain spot at all. I was like, somebody's got to be in charge, man. Like we didn't have battalion chiefs at that time in my fire department. And there was no supervising officer on the fire ground. You know what I mean? Like it was the chief in the buggy and that was it. I was like, man, this is going to be a problem one day. And in 2010, they ended up, they generated the captain's position. I got promoted to captain and I was captain until 2021. So 11 years as a captain, but being really a company officer for almost my entire career, unfortunately, it was fortunate and unfortunate. If I could do it all over again, I would have wanted to ride the back step way longer than I was able to. I think I missed out early in my career. Like I would have been able to to develop a lot faster had I had more nozzle time when I was young instead of jumping straight into the front right seat. If I could do that all over again, I would have rode the back step longer. When I took the chief's job, I didn't take it as a battalion chief. It was offered to me as a captain's position. So when I took the job in the training division in 2021, it was offered to me as a captain. And that was really one of the reasons why I took the job, just because I figured I could do the training thing for like maybe three, four years, five years maybe, and then whoop slide right back over to an engine when there was an opening. And then I got into that position after I had taken the job, it came with a promotion. So like I found out after I took the job that I was getting promoted to battalion chief. And I was like, well, shit, now there's no lateral. And now I can't go back to the engine without taking the demotion, which I would do today if it was offered to me. But I saw the fire service differently as a company officer than I do now. And you hear that from a lot of people that get into the, upper echelon of the administration. The way I think about it now is like as a captain, I saw I had the 32 foot view of the fire department. My engine was 32 feet long. I was here a third of my life. That was my vision. I was very division based in my mindset on the fire ground. It took me getting out of that captain seat and starting to, to run command and being into the command structure other than a division 
to see now I've got like the 5,000 foot view of the organization. Now I go to everybody's fire. I see how everybody operates. I'm on all divisions. I can do because I run as the safety officer when I go to a structure fire. So it's either I'm first due chief, I'm running it. Second due chief, I'm probably on the Charlie side. Third due chief, I do whatever the hell I want. That's best case scenario is arriving third due because I ride as the safety officer if I'm third due. And the safety officer's job is to go find some unsafe shit and get into it, and make it safe again. And that's usually inside. That's the best chief spot for anybody who's listening, by the way, is third due chief. That's when I really started to see the organizational structure as a whole. And I was able to start picking out strengths and weaknesses from that because I was no longer in the division mindset. So I was able to see how everybody operated and more so than just the engine first due or second due or that division operation. But it really opened my eyes. And now I'm in a position because I was always focused. Like I was a proby machine for a long time. They just sent me proby after proby after proby. And that's a real honorable thing for, in my opinion, to be able to raise your young. A lot of people see it as a burden. They're like, man, I'm getting a new guy every year. And man, it's honorable in my opinion. Like your organization trusts you to raise their young. It's not just your turn. If it was your turn, you'd go a couple of years without raising a proby. But when your organization dumps a new proby in you every year, the FBI would call that a clue <laughs> that you're doing something well. So I was able to raise probies and just kick them out on other shifts and raise probies and kick them out on other shifts. And so I was always focused on company growth. And now I can focus more on organizational growth for the operations side. And it's honorable to me to be in that position as well, to be trusted with improving operations of the whole fire department is uh, is a very honorable thing. And I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it more than I thought I would. I took it because my buddy Howard, which is my fire chief, good friend of mine, I highlighted a gap in our operational structure and highlighted some things that could change at the leadership level in the training division. And it's just one of those things that I talked myself into, man. And it's like, Hey, that's a great idea. You want to do it? So I'm very fortunate, man. He trusts me. I'm going to do my best to, to make him proud in that position. I think I have, but I'm enjoying it. How difficult is it to get a department to see itself as a team, as a whole, and to get it to align in how it approaches calls? Well, thankfully, I got pretty lucky with that one. We have pockets of guys that weren't on our level together, but the main majority of the fire department, the organizational goal, the operational goals are set. Everybody's on the same page. Just like every other fire department, you got three different fire departments within a fire department, the A shift and the B shift and the C shift. And my mindset is trying to get some continuity across the board Scott Thompson says it best in his lecture. It's like, if your safety and survival in your district depends on who shows up first due, that's a problem. And we're not there. And I don't mean that as a shot at my own fire department because we're all, all three shifts are really good at what they do. They're very experienced, but there was just pockets that were really dialed in and there was pockets that got lucky. And then there was pockets that didn't get lucky or they were dialed in, you know what I mean? Like, and that's every fire department. I think it was tough up front because I mean, I had a mindset. So I, I hope none of my guys listen to this. I hope they do, but I hope they don't listen to this part, <laughs> you know, but when I took over the training division, I, I was like thinking, cause I had a plan when I took it over, me and Howard sat down and we formed a five-year plan, like what he wanted to see done. And it was my job to execute. One of the main things on the list was revamping the probie process, like how we organized the probationary periods for our people. And with that, in my mind, was a great opportunity to change the future of the operations of our fire. Because like, you're not going to look at a 15-year captain across from your desk and be like, hey, man, today we're going to start doing things different operationally. You can say that to a 15 year captain, but there's most likely going to be an emotional argument after that. And ego is going to get drawn in and he ain't hearing you. What he hears is you've been doing it wrong for 15 years. And today's the day you change. That's what that dude's going to hear. 
So I knew I couldn't approach it from that aspect. Got to do it through attrition. Yeah. So I got to change the new guy. And that it's like a Jedi mind trick. And I wasn't the first one to pull it. I just was the first one in our department to do it. You start seeding the department, yeah. Well, that and I got buy-in from them up front. Because when you look at a, a seasoned guy and you explain the why to him on why operational changes are being made, and it's not just forced down their throat. That's where a lot of a lot of guys go wrong, I think, with delivering messages. It's like they just slam it on the table, and it's like, well, this is how it is, bro. This is what you're going to be doing, and it's not a good aspect. It's not a good way to, to deliver a message. And if you can explain the why to them in a way that there's no way around it and get them to agree without knowing they're agreeing to it, and then get them involved in it, which is what I ended up doing. So like, as I was building the Proby process, I developed 62 skills, fire ground skills with benchmark driven points and how I and myself and Howard and the captains wanted to see the fire ground change in certain aspects, like take VES, for instance, just for an example, the way we performed VES traditionally at my fire department was two man operation. One stayed outside on the ladder and one dumped in. And then we would hop from one one room to the next to the next. Dump in, isolate, search the room, dump out, move the ladder. Dump in, isolate, search the room, move the ladder. And it wasn't until I took over the training division and got educated that that wasn't really a good way to search a building through discussions and experience and and company level growth in that arena, just for example, was easy, but organizational change, that's tough. Cause like I was saying, you're looking at a 15 year dude and all he hears is you've been doing VES wrong your entire career. Instead, the Jedi mind trick is I want to change how the new guy does VES, you know what I mean? Like, and get them on board. They're like, yeah, screw that new guy. We're going to make him do this. This is what we want him to do. And really it, it took me breaking down, just isolating that topic the difference between the way we used to do VES and the way we do it now is that the mindset is I want you to progress past the the room. Like the goal is not achieved from the VES room. The goal is achieved from the division being searched on the floor you entered it. It's window initiated search. I wish they would just take it out. Ron Smith talks about it on his scrap. It's just call it search, man. You're know, like, it's just search that you started from right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just how you get to the floor. Yeah. It's like, I can't use this door anymore. I already used this one up. I got to go somewhere else. <laughs> it's targeted search. The mindset behind it that I had to get them to buy in was I want you to progress. I don't want you to stop at that room. I want you to go into the hallway and I want you to search the next room. And it's going to be faster for you to search the next room from the hallway than it would be for you to dump out and move the ladder and break the glass and isolate. And once they got on path there, they were like, yeah, you're right. It would be more efficient to search the entire floor and faster and if we were already in. I'm like, yeah, ooh, mind blown, right? It's how you'd look for your own family. Exactly. And then once I got them there, like I fish took them with that one. <laughs> and then at that point, I was like... So you got a probie with you doing your performing that operation, right? And he's like, yeah, man, it's a new guy. And I was like, okay, so you got to make a decision at that door on whether or not you can progress down that hallway. Like somebody's got to make a decision because traditionally the captain stayed on the ladder and he would catch the victim or he would help the, the, the probie come out and we move the ladder. And I was like, all right, captain, you got, somebody's got to make a decision. Like when you dump in a decision has to be made on whether or not you can make the hallway. Like, do you want your probie making that decision? And he was like, well, hell no. He ain't got no Rolodex. I want to make that decision. It's like, all right, Cap, where best could you make that decision from? Is it going to be easier to make that decision from the ladder or in the hallway? Like while you're isolating the door, if you choose to do that, poke your head around the corner and see if you can progress over. Like who you want to do that? You want the probie to do that? You want, well, I want to do that. Like, all right. So now we've established that, that you need to be in the room as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and it was just building on those conversations of not only this is the way I want you to do it, but this is why I want you to do it and getting them to buy in and agree. So we changed the whole Proby program and I was on the clock for that because I had guys in the, the phase process as I was changing it. So they were chasing me all the way through the Proby process I was as I was redeveloping it. And then once we got done with that 
and the proby pro because it's never always finished like we're still adapting it and changing it as we go through and adding more skill set and changing and taking away but it was the foundation of the new system was built and i had it on my list of the five-year plan as well to make company standards for the entire organization like not only make proby standards but also make standards for the company level so like captain and below Every year, I want them to do these. This is our training schedule. Your annual training calendar for the department. Correct. And I want it to be in how I want it to be benchmark driven. Like, I don't want you to just give them a topic to train on. I want you to change how we're doing things operationally. So I got their buy in through the probie process and I built 62 skills with benchmark driven uh, line items on them, like for engine work, stretches, flowing water truck work, ventilation, search, extrication, it's all there, all through the, the process. So when I got done with that, I took that document and I took out the word probationary and I replaced it with firefighter and I took out the word phase and I replaced it with company standard and then boom, sent it out to the entire department. I was like, all right, dog, here's the day. Today's the day where we all change. And they're like, oh, hold up, man. I thought we were changing the new guy. And they're like, we are changing the new guy, Captain, but guess what? You're changing too. And at that point, they were already bought into the change. So like the Jedi mind trick was getting them involved in changing the new guy. And they're like, well, fuck, I already agreed to do all this change. And it kind of was my idea through the process. It's been fun, man, seeing light bulbs go off. We use that phrase Jedi mind trick, but really walking people through it or walking through it with them, guiding them, giving them the why. It's the most respectful thing you can do. Then they gain ownership. Yeah, slamming it on the desk and saying, this is what you're going to do, that's disrespectful, right? But if you if you do it the way you're doing it, that's actually the most respectful thing you can do for somebody and for your department. Now they're involved. Now they own it. Awesome. How did Smoothbore Cartel come to be? So one of our battalion chiefs, the battalion chief on the A-shift, started Smoothbore Cartel in 2018, the company. But the mindset behind Smoothbore Cartel started way before that. I would say, was it 2013? Yeah, 2013, 2014, we switched to smoothbore. And it started out with one shift, and then it trickled onto another shift, and it trickled onto another shift. And then now, in about 2014, we went all smoothbore for the lines off first due for house fires. We still had fog nozzles on the rig. We had them on the bumper line, but we were mainly a smoothbore fire department. And that was not the norm for our county, like the whole county. Nobody else was doing it. And now everybody's doing it, you know, but... At that time, nobody was doing it. Everybody was high pressure. Everybody was low bid hose. We were like, as an organization, we were at the forefront of that change before it was the cool thing to do. And we were isolated and looked down upon and talked negatively about by every other fire department in the county. So they forced us into becoming the smoothbore cartel. By necessity, the patch came around, like the black and white smoothbore cartel patch. That was the first one, and it was never meant to sell. It was just made for us to go on the jacket. They forced us into that isolation. And then now I would say about 80% of the fire departments in the county at least have a smoothbore on the first outrig. And then the rest of them are all smoothbore. They just followed in suit after they figured out we weren't idiots. Did the the research on their own, saw the fires going well, because we're pretty busy. We're not the busiest in the county, but we're pretty busy, and everybody can hear everybody's fires, man. That dividing line change was noticed. It was heard. It was seen. Guys worked part-time in areas and made fires with our organization, and it just like spread like poison throughout the whole county. That's where Smoothbore Cartel came from, is the battalion chief on the A-shift made that patch and celebration of what we had become and what they made us. And so I was teaching at the time. I had already joined Oath Keepers, and I was teaching on the circuit. And I told him, I was like, hey, man, I can sell that. Like people, because people saw it on me, you know what I mean? Like on my jacket and the decals on my cups. And before it was even a company for, for merch for sale on the hats, everybody kept asking me where they could get it. And I'm like, man, it's not for sale. You know, what I mean? like it's it's just our thing, man. I talked to him about it and I was like, hey, man, I could sell this if you were interested in going that route. People want it. I said, but I want you to help me out with something because at that time I was trying to think about because like I was traveling. I was going to about 13 to 20 
13 to 14, I would say average conferences a year on my own dime. And I was spending probably 30 grand a year traveling the country, going to conferences all over the country as a student and then teaching a little bit, but mainly taking classes and spending time with old heads and mentoring under fire service instructors. I told him, I was like, I only see the same faces everywhere I go when I'm looking at the students when I'm there. And there can't just be these people that want to travel the country and learn from people. You know what I mean? Like, And it really took me spending on my own dime to realize how expensive it was to actually do that. Like, this is why people aren't here. People don't have 30 grand to just throw at their career unless you're a super nerd. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a super nerd and I enjoyed it. And I was fortunate enough to financially afford it. So I was like, how about this, dude? At that time, I was doing raffles. So like what I would do is I would contact the the people I met through all these conferences and, and training events that had companies, and I would assemble a bunch of prizes, and then I would sell raffle tickets for those prizes. And at the end, all the money I made from that, I would pick some people that bought raffle tickets and fund their trip to a conference. The raffle tickets paid for your airfare, your hotel, your registration. Like all you got to do is get the days off work and I'll send you wherever the hell you want to go. And then, so I repeatedly did that over and over again. When I came to the, to the battalion chief that made the patch, I was like, Hey dude, I can sell this. And like people want to buy it. Like this is popular, but I want you to give me a kickback on every single one of these sales and let me put it into an account. And then when that account grows big enough, I want to send a dude to a conference for free, like meet a guy, find out whether or not he's into the job or he knows somebody that would benefit from something and then call him up and be like, Hey dude, I got a spot to this conference and I'll pay for your plane ticket and I'll pay for your hotel. Why don't you come out here with me? And I started doing that over and over again. So that's how it started, how my involvement and how the company started was that I knew that dudes would buy it and I knew it was a route for me to be able to raise money to send dudes. Like it was a fucking snowball. We could sell it. I could get money. I could get more people involved in the job. About nine months into that, it got too big for him to want to manage. And like it got to a point to where it was sucking a lot of time from him, just packaging orders and researching new products and you know just the retail company in itself. And he had, uh, at the time, he had three kids, I think, three or four kids. And he was like, dude, this is just way too, I'm way too busy for this. Like, I understand that it's successful, but I can't do it. He was like, do you want to buy the company from me? I'll just sell it to you for what I got in the stock. Just like all the shirts and decals and patches and everything. He was like, I want to sell it, but I don't know. I, I don't, I can't even think of anybody else I would sell it to. He made it and I helped him push it out. He was like, if you want it, it's yours, dude. And I was like, all right. So I talked about it with my wife and I was like, man, this is a route that I could take to continue to send dudes to train. You know what I mean? Like I don't see it as a retail company. I see it as a fundraiser. I use even more now that I own the company. What I don't put back in the company for operating costs, I, I give away. And I've had it for five years now because I bought it in 2018. So this is, yeah, this is the fifth year I've, I've owned it. And I've never seen it as a money-making operation. I've always tried my best to turn in very little profit. Like the first three years I had the business, I turned in zero profit. Like what didn't go back into the business, I spent on sending dudes to training, airfare, hotels, registration fees. My CPA was like, hey, man, you need to show a profit. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, if you go four years, like one more year with no profit and the IRS is going to call this a hobby, <laughs> it's no longer a business. And I was like, all right. It's a real cartel. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So now I got to show a little bit of profit. It's like maybe a thousand bucks at the end of the year. They'll just see it as a poorly run business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a very poorly run business. Yeah. This yeah. guy's awful but, at what he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like it, man. It's It's been able to connect. It gets a bad rap. There's a lot of guys that are put off just immediately just from seeing it. And when I teach hot, I teach nozzle work. Majority of the time I'm out teaching hands-on classes. And like the one in Missouri we just taught at, it was an in-service training that I was booked for. They were moving from high-pressure fogs to low-pressure attack packages, including a smoothbore. 
And I would say probably 60% of the membership didn't want to make the move. Like it was strange because the admin wanted to make the move and the, and the majority of the members didn't like that's, that's strange. Usually it's the membership that's trying to convince the brass to go a different way. But this one, it was flip-flop. So like now I've got seasoned captains, that captain I talked about earlier, that guy, and I got a bunch of them staring in front of me and I'm wearing a patch that says smoothbore cartel on my jacket and they're diehard high pressure fog dudes. And I just got to, I got to cross the Rubicon with them and they have to understand. And I'm, I'm a pretty good wordsmith. My delivery is good. Like I was saying earlier. And once they realized that I wasn't there pushing smoothbore, I was pushing pressure. And that's the first thing I always start with when I'm doing, because like we get contracted to do those types of jobs. Sometimes like they'll bring it like, like my wife said, people pay me to explain shit to them. You know what I mean? Like, so sometimes people book me and they're like, Hey man, I've been telling these dudes this for years and it's just like beating my head against the wall. And sometimes it just takes a suitcase and the same message and a different delivery to be able to drive that point home. So sometimes we get contracted for that and they bring us out to kind of put some cinnamon on the medicine, put some sweetness on this to let it go down. And once they figure out I'm not there just pushing smooth bore, And I usually start out every single one, like the debate that people have is the wrong one. And I usually start out the fog versus smoothbore debate is the wrong argument. The argument you need to be having is a pressure debate because pressure leads to nozzle reaction and nozzle reaction leads to abilities on the fire ground. It's a chain reaction. And the number one argument that people need to have is pressure, but you can't just change the nozzle as you know. Once you change the nozzle, it's an it's a package. It goes farther than changing the tip on the on the half inch shut or the inch and a half shut off. And then you go down that rabbit hole. It's like okay, so I can't just buy a six hundred fifty dollar nozzle. Now I got to buy twenty thousand dollars worth of hose as well. And next thing you know, you're specking trucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the next thing you know, you're worried about where the pickup tubes are for your gauges. Right. Worried about what your tank to pump piping is. Like it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. It's a vicious cycle. I didn't get into this to spec trucks. I just wanted to change nozzles, but yeah. Exactly. And, you know, <laughs> all roads lead to the hail pump. That's right. I like it, though, man. I like seeing light bulbs go off. That's my favorite part. Well, if it wasn't a smooth bore, if it was something else that worked better, that's what you'd be talking about. I love how you put that. It's not about the nozzle. It's about what it does. Yeah, it's pressure, man. Pressure's the true debate. And that's where a lot of guys go wrong with it. And most people, and it's no offense meant to anybody who's not a nerd, but most people don't really understand why the smooth bore is a better choice. They don't dive that deep. They don't feel the need to dive that deep because they're not the only dude screaming it. In the early days when Andy was around, Andy was way ahead of his time. Andy was talking about, you know, like when Freeman was talking about it, like though they were on a limb. Now the guy on the limb is holding on to the tree trunk. When you want to move to smoothbore, now that all the work's been put in for you already, like it's already done. And nine times out of 10, people don't dive deep enough. And if you don't dive deep enough to figure out why the smoothbore is superior in almost every way, you can't explain it to people. And they're not trusting the people that have done the deep dive sometimes too. Exactly. That guy tries to deliver the message to his organization. It's not received well. Because then it's just preference. And there's a lot of that to it. There is a lot preference, but there is a dividing line between the two droplet sizes. And it really starts at 212, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That is where the true separation starts. But it's not until the thousand degree mark that the real separation is being able to be noticed by people inside the building. And a lot of people don't dive that deep. And they can't go that route when they're explaining it to people. So then you're just put into the smoothbore cartel camp. You're just that dude that wears the patch. It's a hard message to receive that way. It's interesting that you you brought up that it's usually a preference problem. I hadn't thought about it until now, but a true preference would come from trying both and working with both and then having a preference of one over the other. But most often that's not the case. It's a preference for a lot of people. We came from high pressure fog nozzles, man. 
and I'm not in a position in my career that I would turn down a fog nozzle. Like if I'm standing at the front door and this thing's ripping and you hand me a fog nozzle, <laughs> I'm not putting it down. We're going through the front door and we're going to crush some shit. Yeah, we're not snobs. We're just. Ex exactly. <laughs> but there is a preference and that preference stems from the deep dive that I've done with it. So this is a good segue to now you being involved with Ray and the hen nozzle. I really liked hearing you speak about it early days, but now there's been some time since you first started speaking about it. So what have you come to so far? So we did some testing in Hillsboro, Texas, and now the videos have come out. I never signed an NDA or anything. I was the nozzleman on all those videos that you're seeing coming out from him. At the time, I was asked not to talk about it. And it wasn't that they were trying to hide something with it. They just wanted to be the ones to put the footage out. They wanted to control when it was released, what was released about what happened that day. And they're not hiding anything. They're, they're showing the raw footage of what occurred that day. They're showing the tick footage. They're showing my helmet cam footage. They're showing the GoPro. Everything that happened that day in those six burns that we did, they knew, like Dennis saw it in his head. The first time that Dennis saw that nozzle sprayed against a concrete wall, like there was some a beautiful mind shit going on in Dennis's head. Like he saw everything that I experienced that day. I couldn't see it. I was honestly, I had my reserves with it up until that day. Cause I, they gave me one to try out probably at a little bit before FDIC this year. And they gave me one, a demo. I think I have like number 14 prototype is what I have in my office. And I only used it in a can. So like we have C cans at, at East County. That's what we burn in. That environment is not a good test for anything. And that's the only environment that I used it in. And when Dennis gave it to me, I put it in some really dumb situations. Like I was pushing no vent fires, very hot fires in a can with a nozzle I had no idea what was capable of. So I had the paperwork filled out before we did it. You know, like I fully expected to hurt myself. So I started playing with it and I started sending some videos to Dennis and he was like, what are you doing? Like, Jesus Christ, there's no vent. There's no nothing like, but what I found in that environment is that I couldn't hurt myself with it. I wasn't intentionally trying to hurt myself with it, but I had a, if I'd have done it with a wide fog, if I'd have put a wide fog in the situations that I put that hint in, I'd have hurt myself. Like it would have been negative, negative reactions. And I really wasn't sure what was going to happen because I didn't know anything about the pattern. I'd listened to Dennis talk about it, but like, I don't know if you've ever talked to Dennis before, but he's on a different level. His delivery can sometimes to some people be atrocious. There's just too much information. That was my only experience with it. And in the can, I lost reach in the blade mode pretty quick. Now, that's anecdotal because I didn't have any measuring ability. All I had was a thermal view from a tick that was in a corner. And there was no, like, infrared tape. Like, there was no real way for me to know. It was all anecdotal. Like, it felt like the reach was sacrificed by the blade in that environment. And these were hot fires, like eight, 900 degree hallways and really dumb stuff that I would not recommend any of the listeners do like ever. So I had my reserves with it. So I get a phone call from Dennis and he's like, Hey man, you want to be my key stakes? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, we got some live burns coming up and we need a nozzleman. You want to be the nozzleman? And I was like, yeah, man, I'm in. So we started talking the burn plan they brought a bunch of dudes in that are very experienced in acquired structure burns. They brought the plan together. And one of these plans for one of the burns was a 500 square feet burn. Like the dining room and the living room together were 500 square feet. And they wanted a 500 square feet fireball. And I was like, in my experience with it, I didn't have the reach to do what I needed to do from my experience with it in the can. So like immediately I was nervous and going into it, I related to what I had experiences in the can with it to the acquired structure when it shouldn't have been. Those are two different environments, but that's the only thing I had to draw from. There were six burns planned for that building that day. 
And I showed up. One of the guys from East County came with me as my backup, man. I showed up. We were doing build out. And the whole time I was looking at these burns, I was like, man, this could go one or two ways, man. Like we, this could be everything that Dennis says it is. And the, the clouds are going to part. And this, this, I could just murder all these or it could murder me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I'm not real sure what's going to happen. You don't here. know if this is a fair fight or not. Yeah. But I had in my mind, the ability to turn it to smooth bore was the, like it wasn't blade all the time. They wanted to test the blade. Because we already know what straight stream can do. We already know what solid stream could do. So the whole point behind the burns was the blade. What is this blade capable of in these situations? They were vent limited in some areas. They were well vented in some areas. It was long hallways, short hallways, T hallways, offset rooms, large room, transitional tech. So going into the first burn, I was a bit nervous because I knew what a smooth bore, I know what a smooth bore can do. And I know what a straight stream can do. And I had been playing with the nozzle in a way where I knew it was expected to be. Like the nozzle movement was expected in certain ways. I knew I wasn't going to work it like a smoothbore. And I wasn't real sure how it was going to turn out. I knew what I was going to do with it, but how it was, it was going to be affected by the environment I was doing it in, no clue. So the first fire we did was an offset push. It was a T hallway. So it was a single hallway with two rooms offset, left and right. And one of them was vented and one of them was non-vented. And so I knew the one that was vented was the more of concern. And I knew if I just threw water in the unvented room, it would stall it. But if I threw water in the, in the vented room, it would rebound. So like I knew I had to concentrate on the vented room. So I, I started down the hallway and I just swept it once. Like I just swiped it. Like I was painting the side of a house with a Wagner paint gun and it just erased everything. Like it was like, poof, gone. And this was a fire that was two rooms were fought, brought to flash over and the hallway was flashed over like 1200 degrees floor to ceiling, both rooms and the hallway and just one swipe, boom. And it's like a black hole, dude. And it was at that moment that I gained some confidence like I saw it, I didn't see the tick footage because I didn't have a tick in my face piece. You know what I mean? It wasn't until after I saw the tick footage, but I knew one swat and I knew I couldn't have done that with seven eights. Like I would have had to crush that whole hallway and I just swiped it once and it was gone. Just a, it was like a light switch. Boom. And so I took a knee at that T hallway and I started working the rooms left and right. So I put water in the vented room first, the non vented room second, and then I concentrated more on the vented room. Cause I knew that was going to be my problem area. And I was able to stuff it on the left with the vented room. And I just worked that non vented room and just back and forth. And I never entered either of those rooms. Like never until after the nozzle was shut down just to peek in. Cause I didn't have a tick just to see if I got it all. And I got it all. I was like, okay. I was like, we got something here, boys. Yeah. You didn't have to cross the threshold and go up high and. Dude, I'd have had to enter both those rooms with a smooth bore or a straight stream. I would have had to break, my shoulders would have had to break the threshold. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't, I just didn't have to. And that one was a big confidence builder for me. And I felt zero heat during the push. Like even when I was in the hallway, because I just posted up at the T, when I was working it left to right, I didn't feel any heat whatsoever. Like if I could do it over again, I probably could do it without a hood. Not saying I should or I would, but I could. I probably could have done it without a hood. Second burn, longer hallway, offset room to the right, vented. So this was about a 40-foot hallway now. They bring the room to flash over. It flashes floor to ceiling. It's blowing 30 feet out the backside, lighting power lines on fire, and it's blowing out of the front. I felt they sent me a little early on that one, but what I didn't see was the 30-foot fireball coming out of the trolley side, burning up power lines. So they sent me. Same thing in the hallway, same experience. One swipe, boom, just one swipe down and everything in the hallway was murdered. And then I was able to isolate that room on the right, seal the room on the right. And you can see it in the tick footage, man. I still didn't have to enter the room. Like I purposely stopped at the threshold of that room and I didn't push past my shoulders in it. And I was able to crush that whole room. So your concerns about reach even in a long hallway like that where. Yeah. Cause that was the longest reach so far. But I didn't really have the heat that I knew I was going to have in the big room. So that one, more confidence. Third push was through the front door on the alpha side. 
through the living room and a hard left to an offsite room. So like that was the first one where I didn't have line of sight to the fire room. Like I couldn't put water from a distance in the fire room. I knew the layout because I'd been in it all day, but I had zero visibility, high heat when I went to the front door. That one was the first one where I really started working it different because it wasn't a narrow box anymore. Now I'm entering the big room. That one, I worked the line a lot wider with the motions and I felt heat on that one. That was the first one I felt heat on because I was offset and I couldn't put water in the room until I got into the flow path of that room. So I went through an opening and then boom, turn left. And then that was the room. I murdered it. I didn't even have to enter that room. And I was like, all right, boys, like this is the third fire that was brought to flashover in a bedroom with mattresses and TV stands and TVs and clothes in the closet. Like these weren't burn burns with pallets and straw. Like these were fires. And this was the third fire I made today that I didn't have to put my body in that room to crush it. And I was like, all right. I was like what Dennis saw in is it like this thing is murdering right now. Like that thing's a serial killer. So the next fire was a transitional attack. That's the one they just put out. And they had me pull it what they called a lazy pull. He didn't want me to pull it real fast from the outside. He wanted a lazy pull. So we put it on like half blade. So it was on blade mode, but it was a narrower blade. It was like half of what the full blade is. And I put it in the back. I was at the front on the alpha side. They kicked off the kitchen. They kicked off the dining room. I was about eight to 10 feet away from the front window in that kitchen. I put it in the, the connection point the wall from the dining room in the kitchen. I didn't put it in the kitchen. I just put it on the wall where they met the wall and the ceiling. And I just pulled it real slow. And I pulled it about 10 seconds. And then I didn't even hit the lintel before I got changed. So like I, I told myself and we were talking about it before they told me to shut down when you see positive change, shut down, no matter where you are, shut it down and then move to the front door and then move into the dining room and then crush the kitchen. So I didn't even get to the lintel before I saw positive change, shut it down, moved to the kitchen or moved to the front door, went through the front door, hooked to right, went through the dining room and then finished the dining room off and went into the kitchen, finished the kitchen off. That was the first one that I had a negative experience with the blade. And I don't know if Hen's going to be mad at me for talking this about this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm pretty adamant on using the stream for sonar like if i'm if i've got zero visibility i'm gonna find openings with the nozzle i don't need the tick i could just sweep until i hear it yeah you're, you're the first person i heard talk about that and it made so much sense in my head yeah sonar man so i'm, I'm head hunting with it and i'm looking for an opening couldn't do it with the blade there wasn't enough velocity and audible feedback to change the tone and find the room so like i make it into the dining room it's zero visibility I make it in the dining room, turn left, and I'm like pounding the shit out of this wall with that nozzle. And I'm I'm trying to find the door, and I can't find it. So I'm trying to find it. I'm sweeping. I can't find it, and I shut down, and the fire's still burning in the kitchen. So the dude holding the tick behind me, he's like, hey, man, you didn't make the kitchen. Got to go like three feet to your right, and that's the kitchen. So that was the first negative that I found with it in blade mode. Not saying they wanted to test blade mode. So I didn't turn it to smoothbore. Yeah, you could hunt with the smooth and then just switch back to blade, yeah. Exactly. I could have just switched it to smoothbore, found the opening, but the whole point of it was to use blade only. So that was the first negative I found with it was, was that I couldn't, in blade mode, use it for echolocation. So the next one was the big room. And the big room, the fuel package was like, and they, they put it out, and I don't want to misquote it, but it was several couches and recliners, large fuel load in the living room. And it was 42 feet, 42 to 45 feet away from where I entered the building. So like where I, I stepped foot into the building, the fuel package was on the very back wall, 42 feet away. It was that one I was nervous about because I had my experience in the can, I lost reach, man. And like, I was going knee deep in the devil's asshole and I was 42 feet away from making things better. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> I've got to get water on that back wall back there. And I don't, I didn't have confidence that I could do it. So I was already a little bit nervous 
And it's funny, we were talking about backup line because we had safety lines and backup lines in the building for all these pushes. And I told them going into it, I was like, I have concerns with being able to hit that back wall with this blade. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get it with the blade. And then if I can't get it, I'm going to switch to smoothbore. And I know I can get it with smoothbore. I know it'll penetrate and it'll fly back to that back wall. And I said, don't turn the safety lines on. Because that one was the first one where I thought, like, these guys may, may kick that line on if I don't get a hold of it. So I was like, let me try to get a hold of it with the blade. If I can't get a hold of it with the blade, I'll switch to smoothbore. And if I can't do that or the ceiling falls on me, please open the safety lines. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's at that moment I want you to try to put it out because I wanted to do it. So I had it on because I was going into it, and I was like, please, all safety lines on smoothbore because there was nothing but hens in the building. And I was like, please, no blades on the safety lines. If I'm having trouble getting it with blade, I don't need more blade. I want something that's going to reach the back wall. So I was nervous, man. Dennis knew I was nervous. He could see it in my face. He could hear it in my voice. So they kicked it off. And I go into the the opening when they sent me, and I opened the nozzle for like two seconds, and I just gave it two swipes just to make me some room, took a knee in the dining room, reopened the nozzle, and started pushing. And you can see it on the helmet cam and the tick footage. Like, as I'm progressing, I'm not getting a hold of it. I'm moving forward, and it's it, like I got fire in my ear. I got fire under my chin. I got fire everywhere. And you can see it in the helmet cam. Like, it's wrapping around my face. Like, Everything in my body was telling me I shouldn't be there. My past experiences are telling me this is not going well. I had already crushed it. I murdered five fires on the way over to this last one. So, like, I was reaching up for the, the bale to turn it to smoothbore. And at that moment, like, I was reaching up. I was about to do it. And I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to go two feet forward. And I went, like, two feet forward with the blade, and I was working that blade, son. And I just did, wasn't getting positive return. I went two feet forward and then like, boom, like a light switch. It went from, and it was at a, probably like a thousand at that point. It started 1200 floor to ceiling. And I didn't know this because I didn't have a tick. All I saw was orange and I just moved two feet forward and it was like, boom, like a light switch. It was gone. And I just kept working it and working it. And Eric Guida from Hen, he was right behind me on the tick and I went, I didn't want to shut down. Like I, I wanted to get a hold of it and I wanted to keep it. And there was no way for me to know whether I had it or not because I wasn't looking at a tick. And I was just sweeping and sweeping. I was like, Eric, do I got it? I was like, do I got it? And he's like, yeah, you had it 10 seconds ago. And I was like, all right. So then I shut down. And, and it's not until you watch the tick footage of that particular push that you can really realize what that nozzle is capable of in that mode, in, the, in that pattern. Because, like, watching the tick footage, if you're able to watch it again, like, it's on YouTube, so you can watch it right now. Just, like, notice it. that thing's like a black hole, man. Like, that that blade pattern, it, like, the smoothbore is fantastic for cooling things far away from you. Like, the straight stream, fantastic for cooling far fuels. But I got to fight in a phone booth to get it to cool everything around my face. You know what I'm saying? Like, I have to crush it off of everything to cool from near to far that blade mode it cools far to near and near to far at the same time like it's so weird dude and i don't really understand it dennis understands it like he can tell you the square footage of the water and why it does it and surface area and like i'm not that level of nerdism on this subject matter with that blade yet and i can't tell you why it does what it does but it's like a force field when that nozzle's open it like sucks it in like a black hole, the heat. And it just, it cools near to far and far. Like it's so weird, but so effective at the same time. And I was 37 feet away from that fuel package when I got a hold of it. We measured it afterwards. I know it's 30 plus. So I think I'm, I, it's like within 32 to 37 feet. And, you know, and it makes sense because the, the rule of thumb in high heat that I've always used and I still use from experience and scientific testing is 30 feet. Like in high heat, you got 50 feet in the, in the parking lot. You got 80 feet with a high pressure nozzle in the parking lot. But once you add 8, 9, 10, 1200 degrees of heat, that shit shrinks to about 30 feet. So it made sense when we put the measuring tape on it. And I was like, I wasn't getting it. So like we measured it from when I was puckered. 
and I was ready to turn it to smooth bore. And then like three, four feet forward is when I got a hold of it. It was within that 30 feet. And I was like, well, well, shit, that makes sense. But my experience in the can anecdotally was like 15 feet and it was like disappearing. But as it demonstrated, it has at least 35 feet of reach in 1200 degrees. And if you watch that tick footage, dude, it was, a, it was amazing to me to see the amount of water that was on the floor of that room. That was 1200 degrees floor to ceiling 10 seconds ago. You watch that tick footage, dude, and it's fireball red, 1200 degrees floor to ceiling. And then boom, gone. And then water pulled up on the floor. It's wild. And I don't get paid by him. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not on the payroll. This is a non-biased opinion. I'm not paid by him. And that was a big part of why I wanted to participate in those burns because I'm, I'm a non-biased nozzleman. It wasn't one of the guys on the nozzle, not saying it adds credibility, but to me, it does. Like it wasn't one of the company men I'm going into this and I'm going to tell you my honest opinion. And my honest opinion is that thing's a serial killer. Like it has some problems with it. The price point being the main one. But it's early days. It's buying the first 80 inch TV, right? Yeah, for sure. It's got some issues financially with it and the de- the ability to gain a demo. There's not a lot of demos out there that you can get your hands on. I was fortunate enough to get a prototype. And there's a lot of people throwing shade on it for that. Because the answer when they're asked for a demo is that we don't have them. The response is, man, buy it, try it out. It's got great warranty. That doesn't go over well with a lot of people. And the fact that Hen Cartel doesn't really have the same ring. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's funny. Uh, For sure. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, man. I'm a seven eights guy. Like I'm the smoothbore cartel guy. And that's, what's funny about all of it. But that thing's a serial killer, dude. Like it's, it's hard to argue. And the sad part about it is that people are going to continue to throw shade on it until they're in the hallway. And that's what it's going to take. And that's the catch 22 with it is that demos don't come easy. Acquired structures don't come easy. So you got to take a chance on it. If you're going to have it on your rig, you got to take a chance on it. Or you trust the people that have taken a chance on it. For sure. And it's not going to be until you get in that hallway and it's not a can. I was not aware of its capabilities in the can. And I've talked to a lot of people that have used it in the can and they had the same concerns that I did. And, you know, I just got to tell them like, Hey man, put that thing in a hallway that's surrounded by combustible walls and ceilings. And you may be surprised. Well, being in a frying pan, man, that's a different animal. Man, I think it's a serial killer, man. It does everything that, that Dennis says it does. Beauty. Where are you off to next? Next, I'm teaching with Clyde Gordon, my brother, here locally in South Texas, and then back to Battalion Chief Boot Camp in Pensacola. So I take notes for Chief Ike, during, and I did this the first time. So we did it in uh, October, and it's uh, a week long, and it's his first class that's geared towards the Battalion Chief. So it's Battalion Chief Boot Camp. I take notes for the students the whole week, and then me and his buddy from there locally, Scott Slocum, we assemble all the notes that I take. So like I'm just sitting there scribing all week and then we assemble them all and we hand them a book of notes at the end of the week. So essentially the goal is for them not to have to take notes while they're there. And it's kind of like the Corley thing. They can be engaged with Ike during the class because like anybody who's a, a avid note taker knows that you can't catch it all. You miss stuff as you're writing. Yeah. Yeah, because you're writing and you're trying to relive and remember what they just said so you can transfer it. And at the same time, like Dennis is the hardest dude to take notes for because like he's on another level, man. And he just he has one speed and I'm trying to take notes for him. And then he just on to another topic and I missed half of it. But that's the goal of that, of me being involved in that is I take notes for the students so they don't have to. And then I hand it to them. So we got the second round of battalion chief boot camp coming up in January. I'm excited for that. How do people get a hold of you if they want, if they already don't know to get, how to get a hold of you? How would they reach you? You can't find Kyle Romagus on Facebook because he doesn't exist, but he was banned for life. So you're not going to be able to find me there, but reach out through Smoothboard Cartel on Facebook or Instagram. And then my email, kyromagus at gmail.com. You can reach me through any of that. I have probably 10 conversations a week with people with the same problems that we had. And that's the cool thing about where we are in the fire service is like somebody solved your problem already. And if I haven't solved it, I know a guy. 
you know, like I'm gonna hook you up with this dude. This dude just went through that problem. Oh, it was a pleasure to shake your hand in the fall here, and I appreciate your time tonight. Yeah, man, I, I can't wait to come back to the Great North. That was fun, man. It was cold in Alberta. Yeah, Don't get me wrong. I bet. Like the <laughs> the first day, it was negative seventeen degrees Celsius, Oof. and for those of you who are from America, that's one point four degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, like that's cold, Jack. Yeah, and it gets colder. <laughs> oh man, I was like, why do you live here? Like, who lives here? Hard, like, it hardens God. you up, man. Hardens you up. <laughs> yeah, but it was fun, man. I, I really liked it. Surprisingly Sweet. easy to get into that country as well. I was, I was kind of surprised at the at the yeah. customs. Yeah, we're just come on in, come on in. Yeah, yeah on. it was way harder, <laughs> way harder beer. to get back into America. <laughs> yeah, but I enjoyed it, man. Cool, man. I'll be uh, looking forward to seeing you again. It's gonna be a good time. Mm-hmm.